and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that avant-garde a clue. That joke doesn't really work with an American accent, does it? Anyway, uh, yes, for all the dumb, weird, and outright nightmarish stuff that's appeared on this show over the years, yeah, I think it's high time we finally just went straight over the cliff and went full tilt surrealist. And really, what better time to do that than with our annual Silent Movie Day episode? So with that, we're going to look at three cherry-picked greatest hits, if there is such a thing, of the silent avant-garde. So we're going to take a look at a work by Fernand Legere, with some help from Man Ray. We're going to look at a collaboration between Luis Spinell and Salvador Dali. And we'll take a look at uh, actually a comedian that I think merits inclusion here. And uh, no, it is not Buster Keaton. I got somebody far weirder than that. So with that, let's trip out as hard as we possibly can without the help of uh, chemical enhancement. When I was in college, like most students, I had to take the requisite humanities courses. One of the ones I picked was art history. For our final project, we had to pick one particular movement to report on. For me, after watching each movement get its head farther up its own ass, the overall, if you will, anti-art movement of the early 20th century caught my attention. To me, coming from the music end of things, in which the question of what qualifies as music was very much a regular topic in my usual courses, yeah, unsurprisingly, I latched on to, generically speaking, surrealism. It kind of felt like the art equivalent to punk rock, as in a badly needed reality check. Anyway, as it turned out, the overall Dadaist, Surrealist, whateverist movement was a bit more political than I initially realized, and ultimately crumbled under the weight of its own pretension, which was kind of a downer to a weird kid that really just liked looking at trippy pictures, movies, and, of course, outright middle fingers to the art establishment. And yes, kids, that's merely a signed urinal. Starting in 1923, artist Fernand Legere and filmmaker Dudley Murphy, in tandem with composer George Antile, began work on, as the story goes, an attempt to represent the increasing pace and machinations of modern life. No real plot, per se, just a symbolic film collage. Ballet Mechanique, or a mechanical ballet, debuted at the International Exposition for New Theater Technique in Vienna in September of 1924, minus Antile's score. More on that later. The film is uh, hosted by a cubist representation of Charlie Chaplin, apparently representing a parody and or abstraction of mainstream cinema. The remainder of the film is a constant nightmarish barrage of repeated and in at least one case looped shots. For example, there's a two second shot of a woman climbing some stairs, which repeats for a solid minute. Otherwise, Another woman's face appears, sometimes obscured, sometimes not, but almost always smiling rather menacingly. Shots are edited out and reinserted upside down. Film is continually partially exposed and reused. Broken and or deliberately wrong and or custom lenses are used. Hand painted onto the film itself, color cut out shapes appear. The film proclaims that it stole a pearl necklace, quote-unquote, of five million. Maybe five million pearls are worth five million francs. Who knows? Oh yeah, and at the end, the Chaplin figure returns to taunt us some more. 
It's also worth noting that the film contains contributions from poet Ezra Pound and photographer Man Ray. The former's contributions remain under debate, the latter's apparently consisting of the pumping machinery type stuff that recurs through the film, though that isn't 100% confirmed either. As I mentioned earlier, composer George Antile was supposed to score the film and have the score performed live with the film. As both the film and score were being developed, both parties decided that their visions were too different and Antile was let go and allowed to develop his score separately. In the end, Antile's composition was arranged for 16 homemade player piano rolls at times unintended percussive instruments, four airplane propellers, a hand-cranked siren, and in later revisions, possibly a power saw. When Antile finally belatedly attempted to publicly perform the work in 1926, he found out publicly that it was too complicated to execute live. According to legend, the first performance was beyond disastrous. For one, Antile learned in real time that player pianos don't synchronize very well. Also, the airplane propellers were accidentally aimed at the audience instead of the ceiling. One anecdote claims that in response to the wind, an audience member tied his handkerchief to his umbrella and waved it in the air in a mock surrender to Antile. And for the cherry on top, Fights broke out in the theater, spilling out into the street. Rather amusingly, Antile periodically revised his composition almost until his death in the late 50s, albeit in ever more reduced and conservative form. Some ambitious avant-garde ensembles attempted to perform this final, more tamed version of the piece in the late 80s and early 90s, Though, even tamed, they still had to slow it down a bit. In 1999, experimental musician and college professor Paul D. Lehrman created a 100% programmed MIDI rendition of Antile's original arrangement. Amusingly even programmed, the piece couldn't be performed at the originally intended 150 beats per minute. It tops out at 133. Soon thereafter, Lehrman remarried an out of necessity edited version of the too lengthy music to a Betacam SP duplicate of the original cut of the film. In November of that year, Lehrman publicly debuted his rendition of Ballet Mechanique, running off the MIDI files on 16 Yamaha disc levers, synced by a nearby computer and also accompanied by a few percussionists and two piano soloists. The first, if you will, human performance followed in April of 2000, with eight Yamaha disc levers filling in for only the player piano roles. Otherwise, it was all human. The 1999 restoration slash resync didn't get its first public viewing until May of 2001. It took until late 2002 for anyone to attempt to play the piece live to the film. Since then, technical advances have allowed for more accurate performances to the uh, score, if you will, but as far as I know, no one has attempted to resync the film since then. The aforementioned 1999 resync finally appeared on home video in 2005 via the, alas now out of print, Unseen Cinema 7-disc DVD set. Since then, film archivist Bruce Posner, who supplied the original print to Paul Lehrman in the late 90s, has taken a new 2K scan of the film seemingly reusing Lehrman's programmed score, as far as my ear can tell. Ah. 
I think we can safely call Unshen Andalu, or an Andalusian dog, a South Spanish dog, I think, from 1929, the most famous and infamous surrealist film. And before you ask, the titular dog does not appear, nor is it ever alluded to at any point in the film. Anyway, the film marked the beginning of a fairly short-lived working relationship between two future famous artists, Luis Bunel, best known for his films, and Salvador Dali, best known for his paintings. Upon first meeting, the two exchanged a noteworthy piece of a dream each had had. Bunel recounted seeing a cloud sliced in two, quote, like a razor blade across an eyeball, unquote which of course happens in the film. And Dolly recounted a hand covered in live ants, which appears in the film as well. Anyway, from there, the two decided to make an independent short film together. Aside from the two dream-based launch points, the idea was to create a film out of willfully nonsensical moments. I personally have my doubts about this, I've really come to believe that Bunnell and Dolly simply set out to provoke audiences, but they just weren't willing to come out and say it. Now, the film certainly does have plenty of implausible moments, but it really is more than anything else loaded with often Freudian, uncomfortable, violent, sadistic, and in context, non-consensual sexual moments. All capped off with a rather bleak conclusion. For a film that was meant to repulse, it still became a surprise hit in Paris. Indeed, it was held over for eight months at the Studio de Ursuline, and I'm sure I totally blew that name. Anyway, this is probably just a bit of self-myth-making, but Luis Bunnell later recalled that he was relieved that no riot broke out at the premiere, but that Salvador Dali was disappointed at the lack of a riot. For what it's worth, Dali got his riot, actually a few of them, by way of his and Bunnell's second-slash-final collaboration, L'Age Jor, released a year later. In 1960, Luis Bunnell reissued the film with sound, specifically a few needle drops, a bit of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde opera, and a couple of Argentinian tangos. But to this day, this remains the most common issue of Unchen Andalou. And yes, for all the film's at this point rather faded shock value, to this day, I still flinch at the eyeball scene. Today's last segment isn't devoted to a specific film, but a specific person. Charlie Bowers. Now, Bowers was not explicitly a surrealist, but his work fits well into the genre. Plus, this segment should give a little relief from the more pretentious stuff. Anyway, my first taste of Bowers' work came when I was in high school, when I checked out Slapstick Encyclopedia from the local library. The film included was Now You Tell One, from 1926, in which Bowers plays a would-be plant breeder. This piqued my interest in his work, but of course his work had yet to be anthologized at the time. Actually, none of Bowers' other works were readily available at the time. In 2004, an anthology was released, but by the time I caught wind of it, it was already out of print and fetching big bucks on the collector's market, though these days you can usually flea bay it for around 20 to 25 bucks.
little is known about Bauer's early life. In a rare interview, he claimed to be the son of a French countess and claimed to be kidnapped by a circus at age six and just thrown into their high wire act and proceeded to become a cowboy and so on and so on. Really, not bad for a kid born in the middle of nowhere in Iowa. Anyway, Bowers actually made his name as a cartoonist, first as a political cartoonist, then as a film animator. Prior to his own films, Bowers' big claim to fame came from working on some of the first film cartoon series ever made, most famously Mutt and Jeff, an adaptation of the newspaper comic strips. Bowers produced and directed a fair amount of the Mutt and Jeff cartoons, but alas, out of the 300-ish cartoons in the series, maybe a tenth survive, and most of those are from much later in the series, long after Bowers' departure for greener pastures. Bowers had a run of 18 short films from 1926 to 30. Of those 18 shorts, 11 survive today. Now, a Charlie Bowers short usually followed the same formula. Charlie, usually an aspiring inventor, would create items that did more to reverse basic comedy convention than anything else, and often involving agricultural items, if you will. Among his uh, inventions were non-slip banana peels, uncrackable eggs, eggs, not uncrackable, that held tiny baby automobiles, and my personal favorite, he developed a pussy willow tree that would grow cats. Get it? Are you it's Professor Tiggy Hopper? Yeah, yeah. Oh, listen, Professor, is that the metal-eating bird? <laughs> no, no, no. No. That's it. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Even though this episode is supposed to be about the silence, my personal favorite Bowers short is actually his one and only talkie. It's a bird from 1930, which seems to have gone strangely viral in recent years. In this film, Bowers is not an inventor or breeder, but a junkyard owner in search of the ever-elusive metal-eating bird for the purpose of eating up some of his yard's excess inventory. This bird can also give birth to a fully formed car once every hundred years. So I guess as of this episode, we've only got a few more years to go. That is, if anyone can find that damn bird. What's the joke? We metal birds lay only one egg every hundred years. Bauer's luck seemed to run out in the early 30s. He wound up returning to traditional animation, working for Walter Woody Woodpecker Lance for a while, and ultimately doing a few industrial films. In 1941, Bowers fell ill with some illness that's never been identified, possibly brought on by his labor-intensive work. Nonetheless, the mystery illness did claim his life in November of 1946 at the age of 57. The old 2004 DVD set mentioned earlier was rendered obsolete in 2019 with Flickr Alley's The Extraordinary World of Charlie Bowers Blu-ray set. This set is effectively an expanded, remastered reissue of the old 2004 set, right down to the special features. The 2019 set rounds up, as far as I know, all of Bauer's known surviving works, all in varying degrees of completeness, with one of the later shorts outright missing its audio track. It is still in print as of this episode, though, so get it while you can. Well, 
That's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I deliver my masterclass in syncing up 1920s surrealist films with albums from the Bonzo Dog Band. It's going to be a huge hit, I can tell.